Hi, I am Sophie Vaux, and this is the Rise and Play podcast. In this new series, I am focusing on portraits of women who have an outstanding career in games. How did they get into games? How did they reach their high position and career? What have been their personal and career choices to get to the level, and why? I want to bring more light to the wide range of career paths available for women in leadership positions in the industry, and to inspire you to dream big for your life and career too. Let's begin. Today, I'm very, very excited to have Marie with us on the podcast. So to tell you more about Marie, Marie Aizawa Burns is a multimedia producer currently working as the development director for Tetris on mobile. She started with live action television production, but really built her foundation through 15 years of production in CJ film at Pixar Animation Studio. She moved to game in 2014. First, I tell games as studio production manager for IP projects ranging from Game of Thrones, Minecraft, and The Walking Dead. She completed the trifecta of experience by next transitioning to a mobile games producer at Big Fish Games, then again on IP narrative content as head of production at Endless Entertainment and then at Networks since 2019 on Tetris. So hi, Mary. Nice to hi. have you here. Hi, Sophie. Thanks for having me. You're <laughs> a very elegant and gracious host. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm super excited to have you and I'm so happy that uh, from a uh, common context, uh, we've been introduced to each other because you have an amazing track record, not only in games, but also multimedia animation production. So I have many questions for our discussion today, but let's begin with how I like to kick off with my guest is what is the most exciting thing you are working on at the moment, whether it's professional or your own personal project. Sure. Unfortunately, due to an NDA, as these nature things go, I can't get into the details, but I'm very excited because I've been on Tetris as the development director for a couple of years now, and we're working on a set of new features that'll sort of transform the game experience. And it's always such a delight when you're working on something that the players will have a reaction to, and it's that curiosity of how it'll go. And we expect that to be out at the end of Q1 this year. I do have a follow-up question on Tetris. I'm a very big fan of Tetris. I mean, it's a classic big brand and franchise. And I find it amazing how these days it can reinvent itself through different tech or a different presentation. And so I have seen also the games that have been released with Tetris from Network. So a question I have more like from your personal point of view, Working on such an iconic franchise, how do you approach this for something that is so classic, but make it new? I think that you hit on a couple points that are both the challenges and the approach. So first, Tetris is an iconic classic. Like if I refer to my music from my, you know, formative days, younger people won't recognize that music. They'll be like, what are you talking about? But for Tetris as a game title, everyone knows what Tetris is, right? And they generally know how the game works without having been explained because they've been exposed to it sometime in their lifetime. So as a game developer, what the challenge is, is that you cannot cheat the player of that classic experience and expectation. But how do you refresh it is the question. And I think in the mobile space, one of the advantages that we have is that it's such a dynamic space where you have meta features that really work, that are proven, tried and true. And while personally it's become hard to recognize how many tropes are reused in mobile games, but how they're applied to each game is, I think, very creative. You know, I work with product managers who really are creating those features, but I think that's the secret sauce that we're still chasing is how do you keep that classic gameplay, but bring in all these layers of social mobile gaming into the mix? It's more so my personal curiosity about Tetris. But as you mentioned, a certain generation knows about it because we were kids when it was very popular. And maybe on mobile, you know, it attracts a whole new generation also of players. I, I say that as well, like seeing what's happening with hyper casual. So what's the intention here when you make a game like Tetris reinvented a bit on mobile? Are you uh, trying to hit the core fans of a franchise or also to expand the franchise to reach a larger audience? 
I think the simplest way to say we always want a larger audience, right? Like at the end of the day, games is a business. And when you're in a free to play space, you really want as many players as possible for a variety of reasons. And it's kind of like the build it, they will come scenario where traditionally casual games, especially if they're hyper casual, tend to attract a demographic, which are women in their mid thirties range. That's an old kind of statistic. What we found is we built a game at first. The first incarnation of Tetris had a live competitive gameplay of Tetris. And what it did was it attracted the younger male audience. And it was so interesting that you expect this audience. And then when you do a survey, what you find is like, oh, actually we're skewing towards males to 18 to 25. But you can put that correlation together, right? Like, oh, we made it a competitive sort of esports game which was the goal at the time, and we were successful. However, again, Tetris is so unique and that we also want to not lose the audience. I mean, Tetris as a brand, Tetris as a company, our licensors do a great job appreciating the core audience, right? And we're always thinking about those real professional dedicated players and who know the brand inside and out. So we did a good job in that they were challenged and they were interested in the game. But what we're finding is that that core audience and a generalized audience are very far apart. A really casual player wants to pick up the game and not be intimidated. Hmm. So I think that that's why we're evolving into a finding a new sweet spot. This is exactly what you described. Well, how do you stay true to the essence of a brand, even the feeling of the original game, but at the same time be appealing to what you see for games uh, these days and a larger audience? It is, it is a challenge for sure. Yeah, and Tetris is interesting because you can see, right, like you mentioned Tetris effects, and I don't really know the statistics of that audience, but I'm sure that it would be a little bit more stylized than say the original Nintendo Game Boy Tetris mm. that I do feel like every generation played, you know? And I think the question can also be like, how many different offerings can you have? And can we create discrete identities for each of those products? But everyone's so subjective right now. I think as an audience and players, we're so sophisticated. Like we even know what genres we like to play and what exactly, you know, that is. Mm. Yeah, totally. Let's go a little deeper as well in what you're doing at the network at the moment. So can you tell us more about your profession as development director, what you're doing, what are your main responsibility and mission? So I'm just going to go speak to my personal take in what I do now. It's more the nuts and bolts. Like I always say that as a team and games are highly collaborative, if we each know our own role and agenda, but understand and empathize for each other, it makes for a great team, right? So we're kind of specialists, but generalists at the same time. And I specialize in shipping, shipping as in completing all the development of the future and getting it to the public. And there are various steps along the way. And what we have is the scheduling, the sort of like running of the team, setting of priorities, and really being the point person in the hub for communication, working with the licensor, Working with ancillary departments like marketing all fall into my purview. And so my day-to-day -day will be varied, but generally, if you think of it as I'm the traffic controller, right? You have a schedule that you try to follow for a smooth efficiency, but at any time disaster can strike, right? Or a plane will suddenly be out of fuel and they have to like jump ahead. And you're really trying to kind of mastermind what's going on in that given day. You know, it sounds very complicated when some days can just really be like going to a bunch of meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially in the particular position you have with working also on uh, Tetris here and being in a relationship also with a partner or a licensor. I'm curious here as well, are dealing with quite different type of contacts. Can you tell us more about that? I've sometimes reflected on like why I became what I do, you know, and I think that there is a little bit of like, I have a personal affinity of trying to anticipate and sort of being hyper organized. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I, I really play puzzles sort of in my head and working on Tetris right now is very meta that we're talking about Tetris, but <laughs> it, it, it is way back even in CG production. I think one of my superpowers is that I can really track a lot of different things and remember a lot of different details and kind of treat them equally in memory, not in prioritization from the small to the big, right? So I think that I'm known for not letting things like fall through the crack. 
and I think that that's what's made my success kind of possible is that as a producer, like I track, you know, or recall everything, right? We're in a partnership right now with Play Studios, who is sort of the product owner, as well as our internal development and original product team. So it really is very faceted right now. And we have some new people onboarding and a sort of merging. So it's kind of treating everyone with respect, right? Like someone told me once that everyone shows up to work to do a good job. No one shows up to work to do a bad job. Otherwise they wouldn't work. And so even if you're not in agreement or don't understand what's most important to them, might not align with what's important for the game, but to understand and to have a response or to follow up, you know, even if the follow up is like, this is not the highest priority right now, but I promise that we'll dig into it two weeks later. You have all these pieces and you're constantly trying to figure out what's the most important thing to do right now, but sort of making the other things sort of fit in this landscape that you're projecting out all the time. Mm-hmm. And it does require skill, like a hyper organization and also memorizing, following up, not losing tracks of different multiple tracks. So what is the system you have set up for yourself to be organized this way and not miss anything? Again, super subjective. I know everyone does it a little differently. There are people I work with that carry around a notebook and write everything down. So please take it with a grain of salt. So there's also another little advantage I have is that for years I was a waitress. You know, my family ran a restaurant and later during college, I was working at some high-end restaurants. And Mm -hmm. when you work in an elevated restaurant, you take your orders in your head. You know, you go to six people, eight people, and they're ordering everything from drinks to appetizers to main to dessert, sometimes at the same time. And if you are advanced, and it's almost like this silent achievement unlocked sort of situation as a waiter, you become able to do this. Just memorize an eight top. And what's hilarious to me is that when I started working on Tetris, there's a phrase where you have that memory, you can retain that memory for just as long as you need it and then purge it from your brain. So Mm. it's a very specified short-term memory ability and Tetris actually triggers that in people's brain. So I write down everything in the sense that now that I'm working remote and I'm on a computer all the time, like post-its for things that might come up in a meeting. I take copious notes, even if I don't send it out for actual tasks for other people. I mean, if you're in digital development, you probably use a tool, any sort of software project management tool. And they range in, you know, Jira, Asana, you know, MS project. It's whatever you can use. They're pretty much the same for me. Like I know who's going to do something when, and I can kind of move around priority. And then for myself, like I'm a list maker and my husband finds it very weird, but my relaxation of the brain is to make a list. And I don't know which came first, but like social events, dinner engagements, like I'm making a list of what to buy. I'm making a list of what to do at every half hour because it kind of gives me a structure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I believe as well as part of a job when you need to make several parties work together, there are the points of tension that are uh, here by nature. You know, it's pulling in one direction for quality, one for time, delivery, what the licensor wants. Can you always manage to do that? And sometimes there's a conflict of interest. How do you handle these situations? Yeah, I would be probably lying if I said I did this extremely well, or if anyone did, you know, I do it well enough that I have found success in my career, but it is super challenging. And if anything's kept me up at night, it's not because I didn't hit a deadline. But what keeps me up at night is that if there are tensions, or I know that someone was hurt, or really displeased, I think that's the human side of it. There is a sort of magic dark arts section that we all joke about in production. Like this is the human element, right? This is why we are not machines doing this. Trying to listen to people, making their points feel important, following up with them. You're so busy that you can only do so much. And if you're not having a personal conversation, sometimes I'm sure that people felt very shut down or dismissed And you do your best reading the room. You know, if it gets really bad, I'll schedule one-on-ones. You also follow the culture of whatever team and company you're working at. Like one comparison I have is that sometimes it's like that culture is very nurturing, very feelings first. And so I'm sure that there were times where my desire to win and get things done didn't read that room well. 
especially if you're working with narrative and storytelling, it's Mm -hmm. really hard to make it logical. Whereas network is so interesting and it's that opposite end of the spectrum where they believe in direct, candid, efficient communication. Like just assume positive intent. You're all professionals. You're all trying to get the same goal done. It's not laboring over whether you're going to hurt someone's feelings as long as you can say, here's the priority. This is what we're going to do. And, you know, give them air to talk it out, but try to arrive at a decision and not make it emotional unnecessarily. Mm. Yeah. You know, so you adapt to that landscape or sometimes we're very not top down at the network at the same time. Like we try to be a very flat organization. But at the end of the day, if you're running a project that myself and my product um, owner, like the, everyone looks to us for decisions. Right. So it's kind of like we do our best and hopefully we've made the right decision, but we let certain things guide us like what's best for the game. I think that if you all have that goal, everyone will fall in line, like, and mm-hmm. you can explain it. It's really interesting to hear your different experiences. So I wonder in your position, would you say that your role was sometimes to adapt and understand the culture that was already established and work around that? Or are you adding your own touch of leadership and style as producer, project manager to make it even better? I want to say the latter. I've been told I'm very direct. And I think that has become more and more accepted with the changing of time to be an outspoken female lead. Mm -hmm. in any discipline. I would not be being fair to myself if I said that my leaving Pixar had a lot to do with not fitting the mold. And I don't want to speak for them because I really thank them for the start that they gave me and have only a lot of fond memories and the people I worked with are incredible. And I left in 2014. So I think a lot has happened in the animation film industry and there has been a lot more internal and it's all public, like real movement to have women be able to speak in that industry, which is more established. And I think what's funny is that to me, having had experience in both games is a little bit more new wild west. So there are a lot of problems at the same time, but it's not this established culture so much of sidelining. I think that it's quicker to change in some ways. There was a lot more room for bringing my style in games, I would say, than before. Mm-hmm. An important point as well about being direct and as a female lead, of course, it's not always welcome and it's hard to differentiate. Is it about the culture thing? Is it about the perception, the image that you project, especially when you're the minority in a room? So I wanted to hear more about your own experience, the things you have observed, maybe more in animation and maybe difference in games and still things that we could do better, you know, among the challenges where you can see the evolution from maybe 10 years ago and now today, what's better, but still have some way to go. I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, there's a few things that come to my head. You know, first of all, I'm Japanese. I grew up in Japan until I was about seven. And if anyone knows, the cultural norm of communication is not to be direct. Even for an American, I'm known as overdirect and outspoken. Wow, yeah. Like, yeah. So the (laughs) joke, like people would meet me and be like, are you from New York? Because there's stereotypes of regional Uh things. So given that, I encounter it in my own family first and foremost, where there's an abruptness or a directness that really is jarring and it makes people uncomfortable. Like I was asked once, do you want to do this for your birthday cake? And it was like my thing. They were asking my preference. I said, no. And it was a one word no. And the shock on like my sister-in-law's face because it wasn't (laughs) danced around with like, well, that would be so nice. And in another lifetime, I would have loved it so much. And wow, that's a beautiful thought coming back to like, but maybe it would be too much work for you. And so I politely decline, you know, that's (laughs) that's how flowerly and dance, you know, like I would have to dance. And I think as I've worked in really busy environments where time is of the essence, I've become more blunt and abrupt. And even at home, my husband will sometimes be like, what? And this is an irony because my husband is an artist and we have this Mm -hmm. joke. He cannot answer in yes or no. It's not how he thinks. We have an ongoing joke. I say, (laughs) it's just a yes or no question. Please answer me. Did you pick up our son? And he'll be like, I was thinking about it. And then this happened. (laughs) So it's impossible, right? So let's think about humans. Like we all are together. There's a beauty in how different we are. And again, like I'm not trying to offend people. 
there's words like aggressive communication or especially mm. as a female to be direct because it's off-putting because it's not what they expect, mm. right? And women are taught to be softer in voice, just in tone, right? I think like socially we can still say that and be fair. Mm -hmm. So there is this thing that I run into where I can tell where certain situations, they're not used to it. And I think the question becomes like, is it my job to adapt to each culture or lean into what I think is effective, right? Mm -hmm. Without thinking, well, a man can speak this way. It's not even a, a parody thing for me. It's just, okay. Is this going to be effective or not? But I would say that the world has come a long way. And again, I'm finding more success and recognition in not having adapted so much. I try to be conscientious. That's the difference. I do. Yeah. I always try to say being direct, but with compassion and kindness, right? Giving a reason to it. And I think that as long as people know that you're fair and you have everyone's best interests at heart, it's not how or what you say, it's that intent. And maybe with time, like working with me, you hopefully know. Or they just get used to me and I just <laughs> lying about that. Who knows? Yeah, I was about to ask, actually, uh, what has helped for, I would say, people, your collaborators to understand your style, where I understand as well, you're not willing to compromise too much on... Well, what you think first is more effective, but also over time, more natural to you to be effectively doing your job, you know, what has helped? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, the trust is built on a few elements, right? Time and sort of consistency. This is how I approach human relationships anyway. You know, I don't know someone, there might be a spark, there might be natural chemistry, but I don't really know them. But th especially at work, it's kind of like, oh, you have repeated interactions with them. And somewhere in my brain, I've translated it to like, I can trust this person, you know? And again, for me, it's like, I'm very consistent. I don't adapt my style to different people so they can say, oh, that's just her, <laughs> you know? Like mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. her versus me personal, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that I also try to prove that with results, right? I might start with like, we should do it this way. And sometimes I will like, just as any collaboration say, okay, I'll go with the common vote, but I want it logged that I wanted to do this other way. I thought that that would be better for efficiency or for results. And it's never a question of, I told you so, but it's like the next time you have that opportunity, if the first result wasn't as good, you might say like, hey, can we try it my way? And you get that through. And maybe I'll fail then too, because these are hard problems with no good answers most of the time in production. What's going to go mm -hmm. over well, you know, but I think that's the relationship that you try to build of like, okay, in certain situations, I am going to trust that what she's saying will make for a smoother way, because there are enough moments where it, over history, you can point to that. It's like you can't go and walk into a room or a new job and say, this is who I am, this is how I work, and trust me. I, don't, I really don't think it works. Mm -hmm. I do think it takes a little bit of time, and I'd love to learn still. I think there's always room to be mentored how to build that sooner or how to establish from the get-go a safe environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. I'm running a team, and it's not just getting things done. It's creating that sense of we're looking out for each other, support, and um, safe place to speak up. And, and the last thing, the safe place to speak up is really hard to build, right? We can't read each other's minds. And we don't know in every situation if they've interpreted a situation I wasn't even aware of negatively mm. until it comes up later. And you are working, I assume, also with big teams and again, different collaborators. How do you build a trust or like this relationship where you have consistency in the context we are where I don't know if you are fully remote at the moment? Can you do that fully or do you have work around? There's two parts, right? Working remotely is still a giant experiment. I would say for my team, we've made it work. But we were already not physically in an office together. I work with a development team that is comprised of different regions of the United States. And the largest of the team is in Santiago, Chile. And I myself relocated temporarily to Hawaii. So I think that we had a guided distributed network went fully distributed in May of 2020. They were very early in calling it. But again, we were already in about four or five offices around the globe talking on Slack. 
and we just put in some best practices, right? Like you do have FaceTime. And for us, it's not a daily, but a three times a week stand up. It's not a traditional scrum stand up. It's more like a rundown, but we do have that FaceTime and we are hyper communicative on Slack, like to the point where someone coming into our company and our team, I would say the first thing you have to know is like, we're on Slack all the time, like 24 mm. seven. That's the first thing I look at when I wake up. It's the last thing I do when I go to sleep because it's just a place of communication and it's very rapid. So that's how we make it work. But even with that said, it's impossible to bridge the sort of priceless currency of human interaction. Mm. It's the nuances. It's like if I offered you a cookie, even met you in person, I think there's an energy that people have and it goes towards building trust. You know, I met my main collaborator in December. It was our first time meeting in two years. Oh, wow. We talked to each other every day, <laughs> every day, hours. And we've like, you know, cried and laughed together, mostly be crying. But what was amazing about that is I had to get used to how tall he was. And the physicality of him, like maybe it's not how you imagine because you only see people from the top up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was the same person. And we quickly talked as if we'd been old friends because we are. But it did add something to our relationship to be able to have a meal together and to mm -hmm. have run an errand together. So it spoke to like, we can work distributed, but at least for me, I cannot undermine the value of even meeting once. Mm. You know, it deepens it. You have created a connection with people you work with on a daily basis, but you are missing the dimensions of a personality and character and it enhances everything maybe in a very intense way if you meet in mm -hmm. real life. So I think it's great the other way. We start a lot remote. We create the connection, which is a bit virtual. And then you put it all together, like collecting all the pieces, how you perceive a person. And then in real life, I think also it's quite a nice human experience as well. Yeah. I think as humans were evolving, right? Like my mother in her generation to have a video confessional would be so foreign. I think that she would just freeze at seeing herself on the camera, mm. you know? And I think that if you look at dating apps, like how are people meeting right now, right? You text first and then you kind of have a FaceTime call and then you meet in person. Eventually you meet in person for the most part. But I have known of even players in a game who are on a social chat who got married? This has happened at both on Tetris and both at Big Fish Games where I've wow. worked. Yeah, it's real. It's rapport. How do you build rapport and trust, right? And that's a spark. And you can have that chemistry now digitally. Yeah. Maybe we're very critical in the way we connect digitally where, you know, like, oh, we can't do creative work and so on. But I have to admit, so with our team, we have worked with them for a year before seeing them in real life. And we find some way to connect and maybe we find new ways to connect and interact. So that's uh, part of the evolution, I guess, and generation. <laughs> Yeah. Another fun factoid is that when I worked at Pixar, everyone working at Pixar knew what the term, how's your hallway meant? Because we worked in a giant building that Steve Jobs helped design. And his social experiment was he created a building that was one third of an open space in the atrium, you know, wow. and those bathrooms were all centralized in the beginning so that it forced you out to eat lunch or whatever and forced these human interactions, right? Because you have a thousand people working in a building. Hmm. And what happened is that when we were in production, you walk by people on your team and you say hi. And people that had good hallway were smiley, happy, positive people. And you never even worked together. But you knew that that person had good hallway and you had a positive oh. impression. Right. And there were a couple of people who had really bad hallway. <laughs> You know, and and this like weird is sort of like it was to their disadvantage, mm. right? Because they're perceived as not safe. And he didn't have to be a gregarious expert or Again, it was just eye contact. It can be really subtle. Mm. And so I think that, again, going to distributed, you don't have those moments and you don't pick up on people's personalities and, and ways to connect. It's really awkward for me. But what I try to do is I have what's called coffee time, even if it's like half an hour. I try for once a quarter with everyone on my team. Mm -hmm. We can talk about work, but mostly it's just to chat. If you share a laugh, it does a lot. It does a lot in terms of making your next meeting easier or it gives you a little nugget like you would in a normal setting, right? Like make a joke during a meeting where you couldn't with a complete stranger. 
I think it's a great example what you shared uh, what was happening at Pixar. It's uh, fascinating actually about how the environment is designed for social interactions and in a way they're translated in how we do the video course because I understand that at Pixar we're evaluated on the perception, how you behave and how you appear to others, right? So mm-hmm. how does it translate these days in how we work where it's all behind a screen? And actually I think it's amplified where if you look really grumpy, like not smiling at a meeting, it can actually spread really quickly in the virtual room. Yeah. Because everything is amplified, you know, not smiling is amplified because this is the only thing you see, but the opposite as well. Like you can exaggerate or be very positive. I'm more reflecting here on my own work where sometimes moods or conversation felt heavier than what they were because you can feel the energy or the lack of energy just by looking at each other's face. 100,000 times percent, I think, true, because let me give you two examples, right? Like my niece, she's lovely. She puts me a kind of calcified grump sometimes at ease. She is a joy. And what I learned is she turned off her camera at all her work meetings, right? She's of a generation that feels invasive, Zoom fatigue, all of this during the pandemic. Mm. And I was like, no, you turn that camera on because she has a beautiful smile. And I was like, you're such a positive person. And I can tell you when I'm running a team meeting, it's like you're on a stage, but you can't even see if the audience is having a good time. And it's terrifying to me. I have to put out the voices that everyone's reading a news story and no one's paying attention to me out of my head and trust that they're listening to me. And it's so much easier if everyone's face is on camera giving me eye contact, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the people, like you said, that are positive, we're all humans. And I think every linguistics major will tell you we read physical cues as much as verbal cues. And so when you have one absent, like, Some of my deadpan jokes probably wouldn't go through well if they didn't see me smiling at the end. And so, especially as a leader, I never turn my camera off. Like the only time I turn my camera off is really at an assembly where I am looking at a presentation that I'm supposed to be reading on a slide. You know, it might be a generational thing too, but I don't understand why people prefer to keep their cameras off at work during meetings. What have you observed with the current generation of how we're working that is new compared to the way you were leading teams, I don't know, the past five to 10 years? I'm quite curious, like, do you have to adapt a bit, you know, some ways of working? I don't know if it's generational, but somewhat, you know, is that there is a sort of like an older way that I think about film and film is more hierarchical. You apprentice and you go slowly up the rungs. You know, if you're an editor, you're an assistant editor, a first assistant, and then an associate, and then the main editor, like you don't usually jump. And it's the same way with production. I went through the rungs. It's a ladder and you do not usually jump over any rungs. You might have a short time at each one of them, but you go through the ranks. And what's fascinating to me is that across tech now, titles are much more fluid in techs and games. You could be a producer, but you're on a small indie film, you know, (laughs) you you know what I mean, which is very different from like a 200 million budget film. And so I think that games is a little bit more confusing that way in that people feel like they can, they should, and maybe it's a meritocracy, but it does bring into the question of how much does experience matter and is it truly egalitarian? And I think that I've had more conversations in my later management career days with certain generation people saying, I want to be a lead. I want to be a lead. And I'll be like, that's great. You want to be a lead, but we should have this conversation in a year when you've mastered your job. Everything's sped up now. You know, your career is sped up, you know, Mm -hmm. when I'm like, it took me 20 years to kind of have confidence that I know what I'm doing. You know, sometimes I still feel like I'm faking it, but... (laughs) I've noticed as well, actually, in my recent team, that there's more, you go for it, you ask for it and try. And Mm -hmm. that's a question I ask often to myself. What qualifies for a lead? I did have great influence at Telltale Games, for example. I ran a department of 50 people in the cinematics. They were all cinematic artists. And we were scaling so fast that we needed episode directors, which was a coveted position, right? Like you're really a film director for certain episodes. And then each of those episodes had a lead. 
And again, the director I define in that environment as someone who's giving the creative feedback has the vision of the script in how they literally want to direct the shots, you know, and the cinematics lead. I often think that the department lead has somewhat the harder job because it's almost supporting the director's vision, right? Like making sure that that gets done and managing the team, really. Like the lead is a quasi management role and people don't like to be managers for a reason. It's hard. It's really hard because all of a sudden you have 20 different personalities and you have to find a way to effectively communicate with each one of them, right? It's kind of like being a producer. And so often you're not trained like production people though to be a manager where we've seen models of that and we've also maybe partaken in some sort of training, you know, small to large. Whereas they're usually recognized because they're good at what they do, right? Like also like the director, because it's a step to that towards that, know what makes for a good cinematic shot, what the director is saying, like you interpret the feedback correctly, you know, which is kind of a skill, right? And understand the tools at hand to implement that. Like that was usually the trifecta of like, do you have tool authority? Do you have creative eyes? Like you can be the director's substitute if you needed to. And do you have strong organization skills where you as the lead work far closer with the production team about who should have what assignment? When do you need to see it? How many iterations? should we have on this shot? Those are questions I usually go to the lead to, not the director. And then the fourth is like, can you be an inspirational leader? Are you trusted? And that is a really subjective one and hard for people to swallow, right? Like, well, of course I am. And it's kind of like, you might sometimes be at the feedback. I had one person who really wanted to be a lead and I'm like, I have surveys that say they do not trust you to be fair. I'm really sorry to tell you, but you need to work on that. And so it's really hard when you're in a position of influence to operate fairly because people are always going to think that you're promoting people that you personally get along with. But I would turn it around and be like, usually as a producer, the people I get along with are the people that make my job easy. That's my prejudice. (laughs) (laughs) You know? (laughs) But I think that I do try to be that, right? Like in a good environment organization, though, I firmly believe the opportunities are there for everyone. And it's transparent what that criteria is. And if they feel like you don't have it, that they give you a way to develop it. That is a good employer and a good team. You know, if they just ban you for life, it's not going to feel good. You know, everyone has a chance to change and evolve. Like it's rare. We call those unicorns. If you have all those skills right out of the bat, it is so hard in every job to be perfect because that perfect changes in the situation too. Yeah, totally. And I think that's great to practice being clear about what are the criteria or what are we looking for when we want to promote someone as a lead and you could describe it. And I think this is the way to have the most people who really want to grow there. And then it's learning and accepting where they are. And because sometimes this discussion can stay a bit stagnant where it's like, sorry, you're not. Yeah. And then it creates a lot of frustration as well. And I think one thing that truly senior people or exceptionally great individual contributors, you know, they're the people that you go to because they can figure out the most complex engineering code, feel passed over when they're not selected as a lead because they're like, I've been here longer than anyone. Why am I not the lead? And it's so hard. And I don't think there's a way where we can make it easier because we're all human. We're all sensitive. Again, like if it was just about doing the work, as a lead, you would be a lead, of course. But sometimes the best leads are not the most highly capable people because it's the ability to work with people and kind of take a back seat and let those individuals shine. So that's not in everyone's weird house who's a senior. Yeah, And that's a big misconception, I think, about the title where it can look like you're going up the ranks, but it's a different nature of job that is very people, human oriented and requires different skills. So it's not like a linear progression because you're an expert in the craft that you become a lead. And that's mm-hmm. the big, big misconception. And sometimes it's judgment where unfortunately people with the wrong skills are promoted in the wrong position as we see a lot. There's a Harvard professor who specializes in that, especially at software companies where they make the most highly capable engineer the manager. That is the wrong fit Mm. in some cases, right? And you ended up like robbing your team of this executor and also gave them someone who's not the best manager. (laughs) So you have to be careful about that. Yeah, Yeah, totally. I'm curious, how did it uh, happen for you in your career that you got the chance 
to go in the leading position. You started as a producer and jumped in the director position. How, how did that happen? This point before, when you say you notice that people ask for advancement or are more forward in asking for recognition now, right? That's okay. I think that the management and leads need to figure out a way to deal with that and find honest feedback, but it's not on the people that are trying to rise up to themselves, right? Yes. They, they should pay attention to the feedback and go, hey, if all you're doing is trying to ask for promotion, but you're not doing the work, they should listen to that and maybe like take a back seat for a while, you know, but asking is not the problem. It's kind of like reflection on what's your selling points. Are you really experienced? And then listening to the feedback and deciding if the place that you're looking for feedback is the right one for you. I think that there are times in my career where I did have to speak up. I had to speak up because I knew that I was not getting parity pay at one point. And instead of rolling over, you go build a case for yourself and I got a significant raise, right? I also think that whenever there was an opportunity, for example, at Pixar, there's like an interview process, and I don't want to speak to their current practices. But back then, if you wanted a certain position on the next film, you often sort of put your name in the hat. And later, as they scaled up, they had a person who was in charge of kind of placing all the production people that you could go to. But in the early, early days, it was like knowing who the next producer was. And I don't think it's wrong to just say, I'm interested in that. Like, how would they know otherwise, right? And the feedback you'd get later, if you weren't chosen, I would really try to ask. Like, they would be like, sorry, they went with someone else, but I didn't leave it at that. I would be like, what is it about me that would not get the job? What would make me more the next time? So... I think that that's your personal responsibility to really be like, I'm going to go push myself and really take the feedback. What they say is they put your neck out there because it hurts if you don't get what you want. And another thing is that in the leadership role, it's not fair. The world is not always about fair. You just try to take what's fair and not out of it. And if we're all gamers, look at a game and look at the other players, right? Like, what other personalities do to get ahead and what works for them, you know, like, oh, that's a tool that they use. It's okay if I use it too, which might be being vocal or selling yourself. It might not be my personal character's go-to tool, but if other people are using it, why not try it on? But again, I'd love to work in a world where meritocracy works and someone goes and finds you and recognizes you, sees that you're a diamond in the rough and gives you a chance But no one has the time or real insight to be doing that. You know, I really think it helps when someone comes to me with, I'd like to do this. And then we start having a conversation because end of the day, also trust that people want to help you in your career. They might be too busy sometimes, but most of the time we really do want to lift people up. That's very good advice for yourself as you want to grow. But also, I think here as a manager to encourage people to stand up and ask for things. Now that I spoke also to quite a few women in executive position and they all, you know, share the same stories, like they had to fight for it. They had to fight. And I can say like now as a lead, you pay a little more attention because you know how hard it was to get where you are. Like, how can I support others and encourage others to think of a development plan, you know, so there's a bit of more nurturing, but to get to where we were and where we are today, it was a very different context where you had to be visible. There's only one way you have to work for it or not leave it to chance. So I fully support what you shared. And I think it's something I really appreciate as well in team members, you know, when they can sell themselves and then they have also the confidence they build because they have done the work, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it forces themselves to also take responsibility and otherwise you can just show up and say, I'd like to get a salary. So like, okay, wh why do you think you do? And then they don't, <laughs> if they don't have our arguments. So I think it's also nice to encourage as well. There's a path and own it. There's a platform here. We can help and support, but you need to also walk the path a little bit uh, and creating a culture like this where people will take ownership and responsibility for their development. Yeah, ideally, it's a two-way street. Like, the best companies are aware, right? Like, everyone wants to grow or succeed, I should say. Everyone wants to get ahead, right? And I think that the best companies are focusing that as not to get ahead, like, just a promotion or, like, a salary position increase, but how to grow that they are more about constructive criticism than just criticism. You know, I love everything you said, Sophie, and it's that personal accountability and ownership. 
It's like any feedback. Just think of it as like if a friend told you this, like what would you do? Mm -hmm. But also recognize when it's not fair. Like if you're in a toxic environment, you will know, trust your gut. Yeah. It's a little bit of all those things. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could talk for hours on the topic, but more offline, I guess. And so I'd like also to end our conversation with a few rapid fire questions. Sure. So what makes you wake up every day? I look forward to something every day. And it's usually getting something done <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, days are good. Okay. My second question is, what is the thing that you fear the most these days? I... I'm worried about not growing emotionally. Spend a lot of time really navel gazing. First, like admitting your mistakes and growing. And I'm reaching a seniority and an age where I could just stop mm. and say, this is me. Mm. And I worry that as a friend, you know, I'm a little bit take it or leave it. And that's honestly probably not growing. It's a very honest also of yourself and vulnerable to share that. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, last question, what is your motto in life? Just do the, just, just do it. <laughs> I know, I know that no, that's a Nike one. So let me just find out. It's just like, just start, you know, like, yeah, I'm very action oriented. And a lot of my friends now know me as like, I'll just get stuff done because I don't procrastinate anymore. And I don't really freeze up, even if it's starting to do with a list. But like, if you do just a little bit and not put it off, it makes things easier. Mary, it was great. A lot of stuff I learned as well. You've worked also an amazing environment and so much experience. So it's very exciting. I hope to meet you in real life one day. I'm sure we have a lot to talk about and even more. But thanks a lot for joining and I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. And I genuinely mean it. Like, I would love to have coffee with you one day. <laughs> You know. I would come Sounds anytime good. in Hawaii to uh, uh, see, uh, see you for okay. this coffee. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this new episode of Raise and Play podcast. If you enjoyed the content and want to support what we're doing, rate and review the podcast. Spread the word about it. If you'd like to contribute to the change too, reach out to me on LinkedIn for a collaboration. You'll find all the rest of the content on riseandplay.io, including my free masterclass on conscious leadership, how to hire a team with a vision, or how to lead and build a team for the long-term game. Until the next time. <laughs>